Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Inside Hollywood with Hawk Koch. Hawk, you've got a very special guest today, yes? I do. Uh, I am extremely excited to speak with a good friend, an award-winning writer, director, activist. I think he's a baseball fan, and he's an all-around mensch, Phil Alden Robinson. Phil's career spans film, TV, documentaries, giving back to our industry as well as our nation. For those of you who know Field of Dreams, well, Phil is a man I'd like to play catch with. Welcome, Phil. Come on in. Hi there. Hi, Hawk. Hi, Phil. You ready? Oh, you gotta admit, I got a mitt in the other room. I, I it's just. Let's do it. I, I just, I, I want you to know, I watched the film again the other night just because I, I just, and I started to cry, of course, and oh. went and got my mitt and was just doing this. But uh, <laughs> it's very special. But we're not going to just talk about Field of Dreams. We got a, a lot of things that I'd like to cover. And uh, we're never going to be able to get through everything in your brilliant career. But why don't we start with, tell me about where you, where you grew up and, and what it was like growing up. Uh, what, what, what were you doing growing up? Yeah, I, I grew up on Long Island in a little town called Long Beach. And uh, uh, went all through the public schools in Long Beach. It was a very uh, sort of uh, idyllic Eisenhower era childhood. Uh, went to college upstate New York at uh, Union College. I was a political science major. I have to ask. I have to ask a question there. The year before I graduated, the year before you were there with uh, Redford and. Uh, oh shoot! You, you already beat me to it. Yeah. <laughs> right, now, what 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 did your parents do when you were growing up? What with my my dad worked in the advertising industry. He was a business guy, and he would take the train into New York City every day. My mom was a housemaker and sort of ran the ran the family, and. and uh, what were you in? Were you interested as a kid in telling stories and going to the movies, yeah. watching television? No. What, what what was you know what? I, I I loved television as a kid. I wasn't a movie buff as a kid, but I loved television. Uh, I loved baseball, and I was a big, big, big Brooklyn Dodger fan. And uh, I have a oh, I should have brought it with me. I have a picture of me at age five with Roy Campanella at Ebbets Field. Wow! And I'm in my little Dodger uniform, and I'm, he's got his arm around me. It's very sweet. Um, and uh, many years later, uh, I got to meet him, and uh, I, I was so choked up I could barely speak. Um, but that's how much baseball meant to me as a kid. I, 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 well, then the question I was going to ask much later is, why did you like Field of Dreams? That's a stupid question. <laughs> um, stupid. Yeah. So what uh, I wasn't a good enough athlete to play it well. I, I played well one day. I had a brilliant day on the field. And so I have a taste of what it's like to, to be good at it. Well, I, 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 I got to tell, I tell a quick story too. I got the opportunity to, to, to be at, uh, at Shea Stadium and have a, I was, uh, I got batting practice. Mookie Wilson was pitching and it was me and Toby Emmerich and, and Dennis Quaid. We had made a movie called Frequency and they all said, Bobby Valentine was the manager. Said, Hawk, get up there. It was freezing. It was in May and I was so cold, but I just kind of did this. And Mookie Wilson said, where do you want it? And I said, about here. And I hit a line drive into, into center field. Of, wow. they, as you know, a frozen rope. Yeah. And I put the bat down. They said, don't you want to hit another one? I said, no, that's no. it. Because I <laughs> tore cartilage out of my rib. <laughs> I had, I had, also, you have... You're you're one for one. You got a thousand batting average. There you go. There you go. You know when we we shot at Fenway Park, uh, and and uh, Kevin got up at the plate. We had a, a team of um, minor, uh, no, uh, college kids in uniform playing, and uh, the groundskeeper said to Kevin, "If you want to take a swing, you can." So Kevin got up at the plate, and he hits the green monster. You know he's really, really? Yeah. so. I said, "Hey, can I can I take a swing?" And the groundskeeper said, "No." And I said, let me just stand at the plate. I won't swing. I just want to stand at the plate and have him pitch to me. So I stood at the plate, and this college pitcher throws, what, 70? It was the most terrifying thing I've ever experienced. Because the mound is not 60 feet, 6 inches away. It's 3 feet away from you. I mean, it's right on top of you. And this thing comes so fast, I thought, God, how do these guys do it? 
Yeah. I have well, such respect well, for professional ball players. I think I told you before, but in Pony League, uh, Jim Palmer, the Hall of Fame pitcher for the sure. Orioles, was my buddy, and we were on the same team. And one day he said to me, "You know, you've never, you've always, you've always been on the same team. What about batting practice? You know, come on up, and I'll throw a few to you." Now he was. 14 and already probably throwing 90. I don't know. But I said, what are you going to throw? He said, I'm going to throw a fastball. So I'm up here like this. And all of a sudden the ball comes at my head. I'm on my butt and the ball broke about four <laughs> feet right over the plate. Yeah. And I said, that's enough, Jim. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> all right. So enough about, enough about us in okay. baseball. Um, so what, what were you watching in TV? Were you watching movies? Were you watching American Bandstand? I watched, see, I loved a cop series. I loved Tightrope and Peter Gunn and Mr. Lucky. Uh, I loved um, Naked Man City. Uncle. Did you watch uh, Naked City? Naked was a little bit advanced for me. Uh, uh -huh. But I watched um, uh, uh, Man From U.N.C.L.E., um, certainly there were great sitcoms, you know, Bilko was on the air. What a great show that the honeymooners, great comedy. Yeah. And every night on channel nine in New York, they would have what they call the million dollar movie, same movie every night for a week. And usually it was mighty Joe young or, um, uh, uh, Yankee doodle dandy. They played those all the time. I saw them constantly and, uh, an affair to remember played. Uh, you know, a lot. How about so Man in the Iron Mask or Count of Monte <laughs> on Channel Absolutely. here in L.A.? Yeah, well, the great thing about television in those days, any hour of the day or night, you could see a great black and white movie. Yeah. Because it was cheap programming. They weren't paying residuals, as we know. And so the, the, all the independent stations had these great movies. So I saw Wallace Beery as a kid. You know, it's like you all these Captain's actors Courage I would not have seen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was great. It was a real education. And one day, I'm um, like in my early teens, it's a Saturday morning. I'll never forget this. I'm sitting in front of the TV in the living room. I've got a little TV table with a with some my breakfast on it. it was, and I'm watching as a movie comes on I've heard of. Never saw it. I heard of it. It was called Citizen Kane. And I'm watching this thing and I'm going, this is different. This is different from anything I've ever seen. It's almost like it's not and, and I didn't have the words for it, but I realized later, it's cinema. I was watching cinema, the art of cinema. And that moment just opened up the world for me. Wow. I, I just got the chills. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I get the chills every time I watch that film. It's, it's just, it's like listening to the, the first cut on the first Beatles album. You know, yeah. it's like the world has just changed. Yeah. And what, at that moment, did you think that, oh, I want to be in that business or I just want to see more of those films? I want to see more of those films. And fortunately, I was coming of age at a time. I, I graduated high school in 67. So there were some really good, really interesting pieces of cinema coming out around then. I mean, the, the Graduate really impacted me a lot. And a couple I, of years I, later, uh, The Exorcist and, and French Connection, both Billy Friedkin films, really, I, really grabbed me. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, another film that really just floored me was uh, Lindsay Anderson's uh, Oh Lucky Man. Oh, uh, yeah. In some ways, that did it to me like Kane did. It just opened up doors. Of, wow, you can do anything. It's very exciting when you, when you feel that. Did you see 2001 in that time? I did. I, I saw it at college in the basement of a building. They had a a, a fold-up screen and a noisy yeah. projector, and we were all high. And I remember uh, after that movie thinking, I know the secret to the, to the universe. And I wrote it down, and in the morning, uh, it made no sense. But that night, I understood the secret, and only cinema can do that, you know? It was just great. Yeah. So coming out of college, what, where did you go? What was your first job, or did you get a well, job? While I was in college, I was fascinated. I was a political science major. I was fascinated by politics. I wanted to be a journalist. And I went to work uh, uh, at the college radio station and then at a local radio station and a local TV station as a newscaster. In Schenectady. And I covered the, down. In Schenectady, yes. I covered the Chicago Democratic Convention in 68. I covered the Indiana primary that year. I was really into it. 
And I had what I, and I assumed I would just stay in that. I would stay in broadcast journalism. I had what I thought was a low draft number. It was the first year of the draft lottery. And I didn't want to get drafted. So I, through the intercession of a Congre local congressman that I knew, I got an appointment as a motion picture television production officer in the Air Force. And so in 1971, I came to California, uh, San Bernardino, Norton Air Force Base, and I made training films for two years, nine months, 14 days, six hours, and 23 minutes. You know, I, I didn't know this, and you don't know my story, but in 1965, I had a low draft number, and I went, I smoked four packs of cigarettes the night before, <laughs> and luckily, my doctor had said, Howard has had intermittent allergies throughout his life and severe bronchial asthma on occasions. Mm. And if I hadn't been pushed out because I was 1Y, not 4F, then I was set to enlist in the Army, in the Air Force Photographic Corps. Oh, there you go. I was going to go in 1965. Right. To either Vandenberg or Norton. Yep. We yep. had that in common as well, only I got out. I didn't have to Amazing. go. Amazing. Well, because you got out, I had to go in, damn it. Yeah, right. I right. took your place. Okay, so, so I'm in San Bernardino. Were you, were you directing them? Were you yep. filming them? What were you writing them? Writing and directing and producing. Uh, some was film and some was uh, multiple camera tape. So I was sitting in the booth calling shots, and I really enjoyed that. Um, and every waking hour that I could, I'd be in Los Angeles. So I would go in to hear jazz or see friends or see movies. Uh, and when I got out, I just packed all my worldly belongings in the trunk of my car and I drove into LA and I rented a little apartment in Westwood. And I remember... It, it, it's, is, that a, no is your gardener d doing uh, mowing outside your door? Of course. Yeah, he'll be done in a minute. Okay. Sorry. All right. So you, that's all right. So you got to L.A. I got to L.A. I'm unpacking in Westwood, my apartment. And outside my window, I can see the tower of the Fox Theater. Remember that long, the big tower on top of the Fox Theater in Westwood? And they were showing... Fox Village. The Fox Village. They, it was the opening night of a George Siegel film called Running Man. And they had a large cutout of a running man. And the cleat lights on it. And I remember as I'm unpacking my stuff, my first night in L.A. practically, and I'm looking at that two blocks away, and I thought, someday I'm going to have a movie open in that theater with click lights and... And some of all fears in 2002 opened at that theater with click lights, and it was, the, it was the fulfillment of a long-held dream. Well, uh, a fact that is just coming out, Jason Reitman and a group of other filmmakers have bought the Village Theater. Yes, I read and that. They are going to redo it and put it all. And I, I know of a, uh, of an exhibition company, uh, a, a movie theater company that's going to help. Great. So that that theater is going to be back and running, and maybe, maybe you and I will find a place to have another premiere there one day. Good, because that's a movie palace. Yes, it is. You know? I, I miss that. So, so you got out here. You're done with the army. Yeah, and you've already you've had some experience producing, writing, and directing. Right. What, what was the first thing you did when you got to LA? I started doing industrial films and training films and educational TV, uh, writing and directing, and sometimes shooting and sometimes acting, and it's just whatever I could. And and you know you'd get five hundred dollars for one of these films or a thousand dollars if it was a really big budget one. And uh, I did that for several years. And what I would, I would just, every time I had a film, I'd write something in it that I'd never done before. Like I'd write a crane shot, you know, or a moving car, just something so that I would have some experience doing more things. And after five years, I realized no one in Hollywood is looking at this stuff. Nobody out there is gonna say, hey, you kid, you, you're, you seem, you have potential, come join us, nobody. So I had to just stop and start over, you know? And I, I wrote a spec screenplay. Um, it took me a year and it was a Western and I finished it the week that the Western was officially declared dead in Hollywood. Um, and um, I remember reading an article that weekend, Sherry, Sherry Lansing, it was quoted in the calendar section saying, I love Westerns, but I'm never gonna make one. 
<laughs> and I thought, oh, good timing, Phil. Hey, westerns are back. Uh, yeah, who knew? Pull that one out. <laughs> yeah, who knew? So, but it was a writing sample, and and uh, I I got in to uh, write a few episodes of a TV show. Um, interrupted by the SAG strike, and then I write another one, interrupted by the Writers Guild strike in 81. I mean, it was a very stop and start process by which I thought the universe was saying, are you sure you want to do this? Wouldn't you rather stay in educational films and just be happy with your thousand dollars a month? Did you, lo did you love writing? Or yeah. Was, it, was yeah. it the writing was the best, or or did you miss the directing and, and all the producing, you know, doing the whole thing like you did with the... You know, writing has always been the most um, connected to me. It's solitary, it's it's moody, it's, you, you can set your own hours. And, and also when you're writing, you're God. You know, I can make the sunshine, I can stop the rain, I can reward the, the just and punish the wicked. I can do anything I want when I'm writing. That all changes when you turn it in. But during that writing period, you're God. It's wonderful. It ruins you for life, but but it's wonderful. Well, now what about, did you ever think of writing plays? Because a playwright is always God. He never yeah, has to give it up. You're right. And and I've, I've always felt like that's a discipline that I don't understand. I, I like theater. I don't, I'm not of the theater and I don't feel like I know I, I don't know the, the unwritten rules the way I feel like I've been learning that in film. Uh, and, and I feel like my instincts are more in line with film than theater. I, 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 same with writing a book. I, people have said, write a book. I, said, I, I don't know that I know how. I, I so admire people who, who know how much detail to go into and how little detail to go into here. I know that in the film, but I don't know that in any other medium. I didn't know how to write a book, but I wrote one. I probably still yeah. don't know how to write, but <laughs> but uh, but I, I had a great time doing it. So anyway, right, good. I think at some point you ought to write everything down that you've done because it's amazing. I'll just take a transcript of this discussion and I'll uh, put it online. <laughs> okay. Um, was there a script that you wrote that all of a sudden everybody went, "Wow, this guy's got talent," not just a TV writer? Yeah, I, I had two, two of my first screenplays that I was commissioned to write got into production at the same time. The first one was called Rhinestone. And the movie notwithstanding, the script was really good. And the script, because it got rewritten uh, by the star, and so you, you've never seen that version. But that script put me on the map. Uh, and everybody wanted my next script. And the, and the next one was All of Me. And uh, All of Me, which Steve Friedman was the producer, he hired me for it because he loved Rhinestone, the script. Those two films went into production at the same time. And so I was being treated as well as you can possibly be treated by Carl Reiner and as badly as you could possibly be treated by the Rhinestone people. And uh, I thought, yeah, I prefer being treated well. Yeah, you learned a lot about Hollywood in those few months. Of I sure did. There was a meeting at one point, the, the studio called me in to rewrite the rewrite. And, uh, but they said, but you can't change anything, this, you can't change that. And I said, well, this is going to suck. And the head of the studio pointed a finger at me and he said, welcome to Hollywood. And I yeah. thought, man, and I got up to leave. <laughs> and everybody else said, no, no, sit down, sit down. We'll, we'll work this out. And uh, it was unworkable. But I always wanted a button that says, welcome to Hollywood, just to remind me of that. Um, and yet, I had a glorious experience. Carl Reiner, if ever there was someone who was qualified to say, thanks, kid, I'll take it from here. You can go home now. It was him. He didn't. He said, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, be at my house. We'll start working on the script. Yeah. And every day at 10 o'clock, I'd go over, and he'd give me notes and, and, a, and a bran muffin and, some po and a hot cup of postum. And we'd spend two hours, and I'd go home, and I'd write, and I'd come back the next day. And when he finished the script, to his satisfaction, he said, okay, we're going to start pre-production. I want you to just stand next to me from now until the end. And so every day in prep, budget meetings, location scouts, casting sessions, I was just standing next to Carl on the set every day, at dailies every night, in the editing room. He was so non-competitive and so collaborative and so welcoming. And I learned so much from, from that experience. What an, what an education. Yeah. Tremendous education. And not just... Uh, 
it also just how to treat people. And he was, talk about a mensch. This was a really, really good man uh, who, who's savored relations with people and, and was just great at it. I, I learned a ton. Now, what did, I forgot to ask you, who was your first agent? And by this time, was that person still your agent? Yes. Excuse me for eating. Um, my first agent was a young guy named Peter Turner, who was wonderful. And he signed me when I had done nothing. He saw some little educational film I'd done and said, I'll represent you. And he steered me, he got me the first jobs. He was an odd guy, but a great guy and very loyal to the people that he had discovered. And he told me a few years in, he goes, I'm not good at negotiating the rest of your career. You know, I'm good at what I've done and you need to move on. He told me that. And I tried to get him hired when I moved up to a different agency. And they said, no, 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 he, he does what he does. He, he, he recognizes talent, he signs people. But he said to me, you're now dealing at a level of the stratosphere that I'm not comfortable in. Um, and so I was with him for a long time. Uh, and I probably uh, 12, 10, 12 years uh, until he finally sort of pushed me out of the nest. All right, so you've done, you've, you've got, You've had the Rob Reiner, the Carl Reiner experience, and the uh, the other experience who we won't mention, but we all know who it was. Uh, and then, uh, was at that time, did you go? You know what? I think I want to direct. Or did somebody come with you? Come to you with direct? Or did you read something about how did in the mood it happen? I, I wanted to direct. After all of me, uh, I said to Peter. Look, as a writer, I'm at the mercy of the director. You know, I just had a good experience and a bad experience. I prefer the good. I can't count on getting Carl Reiner every time or, or someone that uh, collaborative. So whatever comes next, and I was being offered everything, I said, I want to direct it. And a lot of stuff came across the threshold that I wasn't interested in. And he called me one day and he said, hey, there's a project at Lorimar called uh, The Woo Woo Kid. And uh, they, they really want you to write it. And I said, uh, okay, but directing is attached. He goes, no. I said, well, then pass. So he calls me the next day and goes, well, I passed, and they just offered more money. I said, I'm not interested. Next day, he says, they just offered more money. And now we're getting, like, higher numbers than I never heard of before. And I said, I'm not interested. If I can't direct it, I'm not doing it. And he said, you know, at this point, it's rude to just say no. They're, they're trying to make this work. Why don't you read? There's a one-page summary of the story. It's a true story read this, then say, hey, I don't, I'm not interested in the story. I said, fine. He sent me the thing. I got two paragraphs in. I called him. I said, you got to get me this job. This is the greatest. I love this story. So I wrote it without directing attached. I finished the script. They loved it. They sent it to every director in Hollywood, living or dead. Nobody signed on. And I kept saying, guys, over here, I'll, I'll do it. No, they're not interested. Finally, they said, but you've never directed anything before. I, so I went and directed some television. And I came back and said, I can do this. And the, the head of the studio said to me, what, what films do you see this like? So I said, I don't know. And I forget that I came up with two little films I saw it like. And he said, neither of which made any money. I said, I'm sorry. I think it's a cross between Star Wars and The Godfather. And that was the end of that meeting. And it took another few months, and finally, out of desperation, they, they said, okay, you can direct it. Now, they said, we don't have time to negotiate, so we're just going to make you an offer, and it's going to be take it or leave it. And I thought, fine, uh, I'm in the director's guild. That'll be scale. I'll do it for scale. Here's our offer. We paid you a lot as a writer. Let's call it even. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, just, we're not going to pay you anything. I said, but... I'm in the Director's Guild. They said, don't tell the Director's Guild. I said, why wouldn't I tell the Director's Guild? Well, we paid you a lot as a writer. Just do it. I said, okay, I pass. Now you have to hire another director. You have to pay another director. They go, we'll pay another director. We just don't want to pay you. Oh, my God. Finally, they agreed to scale. Scale, if you recall, I think it was two weeks prep, 10 weeks shoot, or eight weeks shoot, one week post, something like that. Or... So I got paid 11 weeks of scale. I worked a year and a half, and I went broke. 
my business manager called me and said, are you, are you going to sell the house? What are you, you going to do? I said, what are you talking about? He says, you have no money. I said, I just directed my first Hollywood movie. He said, you, you're broke. <laughs> so I quit. So Peter got me a rewrite and kept the lights on. Uh, it's getting harder to hear you. I think he's, I think the gardener is, is, is mowing a plant in your house. <laughs> he's, he's actually just moving off, off camera. So I think it'll be all right. I'll, I'll speak up. Sorry. Right, so my next question is, um, did you ever date Janice Sircone? I never dated Janice Sircone. It's one of the great regrets of my life. We had to get that in there. For all of you, yeah. that was a private joke for for Janice and, and, and Phil and I. And by the way, email your private joke to, to Hawk, and for $50, we'll get your name into it. Yes. A donation to the, to, the, uh, to the Motion Picture Fund. There you go. There you go. All right, so tell, explain the, the, the plot of In the Mood, because I'm not sure everybody has seen it. In the Mood is a true story from the 1940s about a... 14-year-old boy who made national headlines because he ran off with and married a 21-year-old woman. He was sent to jail, came out and married a 25-year-old woman. And he was called in the newspapers the woo-woo kid. And um, someone wrote a book about um, the sexual revolution in, in America. And they said it started when Sonny Weisgarber ran off and married this girl. Uh, so it's this kind of wild story. I, mean, I did a lot of research. I spent a lot of time in the library reading all the old newspaper articles. And I realized that, you know, this wasn't a sex story. It was, he was just this nice, lonely kid who was nice to these women. And it's this very sweet story. And uh, I had a good time on that. It was a very low-budget film. No one saw it, made no money. But uh, we were all proud of it. So from there, you do a rewrite. And who gives you the, I guess, the book? Or yeah. Field of Dreams. Sure. Uh, uh, um, I, when I was working at APCO Embassy, Lindsay Duran had just been promoted from secretary to story editor, and she gave me this book, Shoeless Joe by W.P. Kinsella. And she said, you got to read this book. I said, I like books. What's it about? She said, it's about a farmer. I said, nah, it's not really for me. She said, no, 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 wait. He hears a voice. I said, oh, this is really not for me. She says, he has to go kidnap J.D. Salinger. I said, stop. I'm not reading this stupid book. She made me read. She, it was like a homework assignment. I went home that night, I was grumbling. And I started reading it, and literally, the expression, you couldn't put it down, I sat up all night till I finished the book. I couldn't put it down. And then she and I tried for several years to, to get it set up, we couldn't. Uh, but I never let go of it. And finally, uh, I was working on sneakers at Fox. Uh, Scott Rudin was one of the executives, and Scott said, I understand I just bought the rights to one of your favorite books. And uh, he had bought Shoeless Joe. So we made a deal. In the Mood had just opened and died. It didn't make lunch money. And he hired me and he said, you want to, uh, you want to direct it? I said, yeah. He said, okay, you can write and direct it. I, to this day, I don't quite understand why the universe did that for me, but I'm very grateful. So, so they gave it to Larry Gordon to be the producer of? Uh, well, Scott was working for Larry. Got it. Uh, and... Uh, Part of Larry's golden parachute, as every studio head negotiates, hey, when you fire me, here's what I get to do. And this was one of the projects he gets to take with. Got it. Okay, so you jump up and down, and was this a, because I know you spent a lot of time writing sneakers and rewriting a lot of stuff. Was this like, like, through, like butter, or was this tough? Right. This, this, I'm embarrassed to say, was the easiest thing I've ever written because, for two reasons. One, the author of the book had done the heavy lifting. He had come up with this, this amazing situation and characters and milieu and, and, and events. I made quite a few changes, but really the heavy lifting was his. And the other is, for years, I've been telling people the story. Uh, I say, God, I read this book. It's fantastic. And every time I tell a story, I would change it just a little till I got to where I thought the movie would be move this thing to the end, make this a surprise, hold this back, cut that out. So for years, I was refining the story by telling it to people. So by the time I sat down to write, there wasn't a lot of discovery left for me. There was a little bit, but I knew, I really knew what I wanted to write and how to write it. And by that time was, 
Now, was, was it still at Fox? I don't remember. Why do I think it's at Universal? It, it wound up there. Fox put it and Sneakers in Turnaround, uh, and they both wound up at Universal. Uh, but Field of Dreams, um, which was still called Shieldless Joe at the time, uh, they put in Turnaround. Larry was already a producer at that point. You know, he had left the presidency and was a producer. And we took it to uh, Paramount, really was interested. Uh, Ned Tannen uh, made a play for it. And um, and Universal did, and and I think I don't know this, but I think every executive at Universal wanted to do it. I think if one had expressed doubt, it, it's such an odd story that it might have sunk it. And that, I think there was, was someone at who was there, Casey or uh, Tom Pollock, uh, Sean Daniel, Casey Silver, right? Uh, and um, it was. Um, it was just a magical confluence, you know. And so, so did they say, love the script, you can direct, go with it, uh, or was it hard to get it greenlit, or once Tom, or did, did you have a cast before it was greenlit? Do you have the budget and cast, or you just go get a we cast? Not, we just had a script. Within a few days of them reading it, Tom said to me, we're making this film, you can cast anybody you want in the lead. The budget will expand or contract accordingly. You can have a big star. You can have a nobody. Just understand that's going to affect the budget. And who, and and who, did, who did you want? Who, who was your first thought? We had a list of people in the right age range. Um, it was the usual list of everybody, every star in in you know in their thirties, and. Uh, Unbeknown, and we did not have Kevin Costner on the list because he had just made Bull Durham. Right. And, and it was hard to believe an, a movie star would make one baseball movie because they were considered box office poison. It was impossible to believe they'd do two in a row. Josh Donnan, who was an executive at Universal at the time, ran into Kevin at a restaurant and said, hey, we've got this script. I think you'd like it. And he snuck the script to him. And Kevin called the next day and said, I really like this. You know, I, and I said, I understand, you know, you may be out to someone else. I don't want to take a job away from an actor, but if it becomes available, call me. And when I heard that, I just said, stop everything else. That's the guy. That's who we want. Uh, I had breakfast with Kevin like the next day. I had a great breakfast with him where I, I, I stammered a lot. And I said, look, I, I just want to make a film that has a chance for people to say that's the best film ever made. And he said, I love that kind of talk. He said, I am so behind you. He says, you will feel a lot of pressure to make changes. There'll be pressure from the studio. There'll be pressure from within you and things aren't. He said, I'll be the little voice behind your shoulder whispering in your ear, don't change a word. And that support from a movie star for a young director and a young unproven director is just gold. It's just gold. Wow. Very lucky, Phil. Good for Very you. Lucky. So now, I, found, I found a movie star who, who shared the vision, you know, and, and who was going to fight to the death to, to keep that vision. It's funny. I've always said when people go, how come producers and directors always fight? And I always say, because the ones that fight didn't have the same vision of the movie that they both thought they were going to make. If you mm -hmm. can get a producer and a director and an actor who all have the same vision, it, it can be really smooth. Really smooth. And it's an amazing feeling to, to, to take this solitary job, but be part of a team. Yeah. Where everybody's rowing in the same direction. It's fantastic. I mean, behind me are the pictures of my second family, my movie. Right. You know, it's, I understand totally. Uh, so now, uh, was the, in the book, was, was the, uh, the writer named J.D. Salinger, or was it uh, yeah. a different name? Terrence Mann. Uh, in the book, it's J.D. Salinger. It's really J.D. Salinger. And yeah, so what, how, how come you, change, I'm sure I, it's universal lawyers, maybe. Well, there was that, but also I didn't want to do J.D. I felt like there were, it was putting a hat on a hat. You know, it's like I felt like there was enough weirdness in this movie already that to add J.D. Salinger into the mix and you get, you know, you get Paul Newman to play him and you go, that's ah, Paul Newman playing J.D. Salinger. It would have been great, but I don't, I think it would have 
misshapen the movie somehow. I felt like it would have taken the audience's attention off of what I wanted it to be on. So at, unbeknownst to me, Salinger's lawyers had written the publisher of the book a letter saying, don't exploit this in any other medium. We reserve our right to sue. So the studio lawyers are very happy that I wanted to change it. All right, so I have a question. I have a question now. Yes. But, uh, in the last week, as I'm sure all of us have seen, is that casting directors not only have a branch, which when you and I were on Governors, we allowed them in to have their own branch, but now they're going to get an Oscar, not this year, but I think next year or the year after. Right. So my question is, who came up with the idea of James Earl Jones to play Terrence Mann? I did. I, I was trying to come up with I was trying to come up, by the way, Margie Simpkin cast the movie and cast it brilliantly. But when she's I was trying to, up, she's a great casting director. When I was trying to come up with the non J.D. Salinger character, I started to think, well, who, what's the essence of this? What's it? And I, and I came up with, I said, you know, Kevin Costner's character has to kidnap this guy. So it ought to be a big guy. It'd be fun to see him have to kidnap a big, powerful man. And I had just seen Fences on Broadway. And James Earl Jones in Fences on Broadway was one of the most powerful performances I have ever seen in my life. And I remember coming out of that, that, that play thinking, that's a man, you know? And that's why he's named Terrence Mann. I mean, Terrence so, Mann. yeah. So when I thought right. of that. Okay, uh, Burt Lancaster. I mean, Burt Lancaster. I mean, yeah. for those. I mean, everybody at the home and all you residents, you, Burt Lancaster was as big as there was ever. Yeah. You know. Well, we originally went out to Jimmy Stewart. That was my dream to have Jimmy Stewart in this movie because there are, of course, echoes, right? And uh, he turned it down. Um, and I, I didn't hear why. I later heard that he, I think his health might not have been good. I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, he turned it down. And at this point, I was set on, I want a movie star. I want a movie star in this role from that generation. And we had a list. And Bert had been an athlete as a young man. He'd been a circus uh, acrobat. And it was important to me that you believe this old doctor was once an athlete. So he was the obvious next choice. And uh, read it and he told me. I want to ask, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Did, had you seen Secret of My Success? <laughs> Million dollar oh. movie? Was that ever? Oh, of course. And 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 by the way, I'll tell you, I'll get to the um, uh, um, to his movies in, in a bit. Um, um, we he told me that when he read the script, he didn't understand it and was going to pass. And he had an he had a coach. He had an acting coach who was sort of his advisor who said to him, no, 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 Bert, you have to play this role. You got to do this. And so he sort of got talked into it uh, and uh, was wonderful. Showed up at uh, the read-through. It's the first time I, I met him. And um, he said, um, I want to wear a little mustache and I want to wear a little hat. And I said, okay, uh, why? He said, I don't want to look like Bert Lancaster. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so here's my sweet smell of success, a little anecdote about him. We had a difficult time on the set. Bert, Bert was a tough guy, and he was ornery, and, and um, we butted heads. And I had to bring him into loop, and I thought, oh, God, he's going to kill me because I cut some lines out. So the night before he came into loop, I, I ran sweet smell of success. And so when he walked in the door of the studio, I said, Bert, man, I watched Sweet Smell of Success. I said, what a great movie that is. That's a tough movie. He said, oh, it's a tough movie. They'd never make that movie today. I said, boy, you were great. And he said, oh, you know, I wasn't going to be in it. I was just going to produce it. But they said, we're not going to finance it unless you're in it. So I had to be in it. And so we were talking about the movie, and I lead him over to the, the desk with the microphone, and we run the scene. He goes, uh, just a second. I see you cut some lines. That's a good cut. It's a good cut. I see why you did that. It's a good cut. And then he was a dream that day. And I was so grateful that I had a lovely experience with him because it was tough. It was tough on the set. In fairness to him, he was in failing health. He's on a set full of young, healthy guys who are throwing baseballs around, and he had trouble sometimes standing up. So it was emotionally difficult for him, but, man, he came through. Wow. Oh, man. 
I, I again, I hadn't seen that your film in a long time. So now, obviously, it's a giant hit. Everybody loves it. Phil Robinson is, you know, and Janice Sircone keeps saying, I, I, I know Phil, I know Phil. You know, yeah. she claimed yeah. friendship to you at that point. Absolutely. But, um, but uh, you get nominated. You get nominated. Now, you go to the Oscars, and you and I hung out together at the as Academy Governors a few years later, but... What was it like going to the Oscars? That was probably the first time you went, right? I had been once before as, the, as a date. So I had the experience of what the evening is like. So that, that was an advantage. I knew how long it was. And, and also the feeling, you know, as they near your award, the, the butterflies and whatnot. So I, I had that experience. But it was great. I got to take my parents, you know, and, and that was wonderful uh, for them to experience that. I did not expect to win. I did not win. I know there are people who are crushed by that. I can honestly, I swear to you, it's the God's honest truth. It's fine. I made the movie I wanted to make and people liked it and I got nominated. The Oscar would have been lovely. It, it would not have changed my life at all. I'm so thrilled to have been part of all that. I'm nothing but grateful. Well, uh, knowing you as I do, I, I totally believe that. But the Writers Guild gave you the Valentine Davies Award for contributions to the entertainment industry and the community at large. Now that's quite an honor. So I want to know what what were you doing in the community that made them feel like you deserved that award? Because I know you, I know what you did, but I want you to tell me. I I after sneakers actually, you know, I took a year off after Field of Dreams, just had a life. And I did it again after Sneakers, which was wonderful. And one of the things that I did after Sneakers, that year off, I was invited by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees to be an observer on a relief mission to Somalia and then to Bosnia. And I didn't really know much about either place. They said, do you want to go? I said, sure. And then I started reading about both places and there were wars going on. I thought, well, I'm not sure this is such a good idea. And I instinctively went out and bought a video camera because I felt I realized later I must have felt if I have a task, I, I think I could handle this. And Somalia was a very difficult experience. There were people dying in the streets, but I just kept looking through the lens and kept documenting what I saw. And then we went to Bosnia and we took a relief convoy across country. The war was nine months in at that point. And we got to Sarajevo, which was almost totally bombed out, uh, just devastated. And I saw in Sarajevo a production of hair during the war and I filmed it and when I, I it was extraordinary it was a theater with you know a generator so they had enough power for the amplifiers and people are bundled up in their coats because there's no heat and they're, they're doing let the sunshine in it was fantastic uh came back I had all this footage didn't know what to do with it a friend of mine was producing at ABC News and she said you know maybe Nightline would be interested and Nightline said yeah we're give us the footage and we'll interview you and I said you know what I could be more articulate if you'd let me cut, cut it together and I'll write a narration. They said, fine. So I did one on Somalia and one on, on uh, Sarajevo. Then wound up going back to Sarajevo several more times during the war to do more documentaries for them. And I think it was that, and I, I just got involved in trying to raise public awareness about, about the war in Sarajevo because it was a war in which uh, the forces of intolerance and ignorance and hatred and division were trying to destroy multicultural society. Uh, it's a war that we're still fighting in some ways. Uh, I, I must tell you, I, I love the fact that probably when you were doing industrial films and you were the camera and you were doing everything, you had no idea how all that experience was going to pay off to something really is as wonderful as you were able to do in Bosnia and, and, and Somalia. So it's exactly right. It's exactly right. I always try and tell young people, just keep doing it. You have no idea what's going to happen down the line, the more you can learn. So that's, that's a, that's a really good lesson. So and feature filmmaking, as you know, is about lots of equipment and lots of people and you got to coordinate everything and nothing happens spontaneously hardly this was all about hey there's just me and my camera 
Yeah. And the freedom of that is spectacular. I don't want to do that always, but boy, in the right circumstance, it's really wonderful. Right. So I promised in the uh, flyer that uh, you you had worked with, uh, <coughs> you knew Sidney Poitier and actually I think had written a, a script that he directed um, or was in. And Sidney was in Sneakers. Right. And uh, will you tell the story of how uh, you sang uh, for, uh, for Sidney's birthday? Sidney, uh, as you know, was the most wonderful man. I mean, still, I think the most wonderful man I've met in this business. He was, he had so much goodness and dignity and strength and talent and presence and genuine warmth. Every time I saw him till he passed, every time I saw him, he would begin by saying something to make me feel good. He always would begin every conversation with some a compliment or something warm. Loved him. And he was great in the movie. And I noticed one day on the set, when Sidney was on the set, everybody behaved better. It was extraordinary. I've never seen that with anybody else. But when Sidney was on the set, grips were saying, excuse me, and thank you, and please, and everybody was on their best behavior. So we, used, we had a tradition on, on the set of sneakers. Every day we would sing happy birthday to somebody, whether it was their birthday or not. It was just something to kind of keep our spirits up. We'd just say, hey, it's the script supervisor's birthday. She goes, no, it's not. We'd all go happy birthday. Well, one day we realized, hey, tomorrow is Sydney's birthday. So we have to do something. It's his actual we're not, birthday. We're not, his not actual sure. birthday. It's uh, February something, I think. He, um, we, uh, we got a big cake. And I had the uh, prop master who, of course, has everything. If you can ask a prop master for anything, left-handed mustache wax. Yeah, I got it. You want red or green? Um, I said to him, I need a cas cassette of To Sir With Love. And uh, he had it. <laughs> and we Xeroxed the lyrics and passed it out to the crew and said, everybody, you got to memorize these lyrics tonight because we're going to sing it to Sydney tomorrow. And the next day, we're setting up a shot and we call, the AD calls to bring Sydney on the set from the trailer, and the whole crew gathers around the camera, and when he steps onto the stage, we all sing those schoolgirl days. You know, it's a, it's a bad sing-along song. It's not easy to sing, especially with a crew full of people who don't sing. But you get to the end of the, the verse, and it's like, to sir, with love, and it was, and that's all, we got that far and, and no more. And Sydney just stood there, and when we finished, he said, Next to my closest family, I cannot think of anybody I would rather spend this day with than all of you. Oh, God, lovely. I can't, get, we, we don't have a lot of more time, but I just wanted everybody to know that finally you were nominated for a bunch of Emmys and obviously for Oscars. You actually won one for Band of Brothers. Well, all the directors uh, of the series uh, were a right. single entry. So we all went in as one entry and, and the, the, the group of directors won, yes. So you you were able to actually you have an Emmy, I I have one uh, over there. Okay, so now uh, in the in the aughts, I, I guess they call them the aughts. aughts I yes. became I became a governor of the academy, as did you. Yes, and uh, I must I just have to tell our audience that Phil had a way of working with the governors and ideas that came out of his mouth that so many of them got made because of Phil. So I wanted to, A, thank you for that. B, thank you because he nominated me for president at the time. And C, once I was president and I was up to my tuchus with problems, uh, I really wanted digital voting because I thought it was all we got was paper. You know, and it was we were becoming an international organization, but I couldn't get it through. I couldn't get it done. And I called Phil and I said, you know what? I think I'm just going to quit. I just can't do it. And Phil said to me, don't quit. You'll find a way. Go ahead. You know, don't. don't that's a great idea. And you've got to find a way. And honestly, because of Phil, I, I said, oh, wait a minute. There's a guy I know. And long, long story short, as all of you know, 
digital voting is nobody even knows what paper is anymore. So again, I want to thank you, Phil, for uh, for what and you do. And that two-year term, I think, was the most consequential two-year term in a long, long time. More more significant changes happened in that two years because of you uh, and and the board seeing the wisdom of what you were trying to do. That that was really uh, it was helped modernize the academy. Thank you. Yeah. So, how are you navigating the industry today? Uh, like an old guy, uh, I'm. Uh, I'm still just trying to do the stuff I want to do. I, I turn down things I'm not interested in. I've got, I'm happy to say, two projects I'm working on now, uh, both limited series. Uh, I think the big change for me is I think features, I, you know, I didn't read comic books as a kid, and I don't read them now. And I think that until feature filmmaking, uh, the pendulum swings back towards grown up storytelling, I think. Um, uh, streaming and television is is where the, the, my meat uh, is being kept cold. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm happy to be doing these projects and uh, working with good people. And uh, so, so th these aren't spec; these are four uh, companies. So you're actually yeah, two different two different uh, gigs that uh, I'm very happy to have. There we haven't announced them yet, so I shouldn't do it now. But they're both uh, true stories, uh, very very exciting, and and I'm really really happy to have them. Good. So we don't we don't have to worry about the poor house like you did in the early eighties. That's right. Yeah. In the seventh, yeah. Just just wanted to just wanted yeah, to you. check that. Uh, tell me what you think about uh, the Oscars this year. Have you got a favorite? I, I mean, can't you don't have to say who you're going to vote for, but are there okay. films that uh, that really is, wet your very, very interesting year because you run the gamut. And for me, two films that I really loved, Barbie and Zone of Interest. I mean, you can't get further apart than those two films. I thought they were both brilliantly made, the, the, the uh, work of vision. Uh, Zone of Interest, I've never seen anything like that in my life. I, I, I was just floored by it. I just think it's a true work of art. Um, I don't think that there was the depth uh, this year, as there had been in previous years, but I think that's also part of the fact that the business has changed and feature filmmaking is not where all of the best work goes as it used to. Um, I shouldn't say all. I mean, there was always great work on television, but now things that would have been features uh, 20 years ago are now being made for cable and streaming and whatnot, and that's, that's fine. So I think that features have a ways to come back. You know, there's, they're, they're, they, they've done very well with fantasy films and, and special effects films. I get tired of that stuff. Uh, when I see too many special effects, my pulse no longer quickens because I know that that person really isn't jumping off the roof, you know? Um, so I, I think I could use a lot more uh, Oppenheimer uh, and less superheroes. Yeah, well, I think that, I, I think you're right. But I'm one thinking that Barbie and for Oppenheimer to do a billion dollars says there is a market for really good films yep. for the kinds of films that you and I have always, you know, been drawn to. Right. So I'm hoping also that there will be there will be that that kind of rebirth because Hollywood is I mean, as you know, uh, in. Uh, we did a survey, I think, when you and I were governors, that they were talking about the biggest brands in the world. Number one was Coca-Cola. Number two was Disney. And number three was the Oscar. That They knew that brand more than anything else. So right. to keep that alive, we've, we've got to keep theatrical films alive, I think. You know, we as, as governors, so I, I took a lot of trips overseas. I know you did too. And when you go around the world, people refer to the Oscar Academy and say, oh, you're from the Oscar Academy. Uh, and I think that's, that tells you something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, I'm gonna bring in um, Jen back because she always has two questions that, uh, there she is. Uh, first of all, before Jen starts, I just wanna, Phil, 
I've had a great, it's one of the best hours <laughs> I've had in a long time. Oh, I've Peter, really had a, a lot of fun. I, I have not seen you in person since before COVID, I don't think. Yeah, right. We used to have lunch in Westwood. And All the time, yeah. It's crazy. We'll to do so it again. I'm happy to see you here, but I'd love to see you in person. Yeah, you go. And, and before, maybe we should invite Janice to, to our lunch. Let's invite Janice and the entire audience watching today should just join us for lunch. Okay. Hawk, is a, Hawk is a very generous man. I'm sure he'll pick up the tab. Does this mean that it's uh, finally the date? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, because you shouldn't live with regrets. Absolutely. Right? But I'm, I'm married, so I, I don't live with regrets. But okay, good. Janice is married, and we like each other's spouses. But yes. next time, we'll talk. Okay. Um, I actually have three questions this time because one of the crew um, sent me a question while the interview was in the middle of the interview. So do you have time for three? Yes. Okay. So um, the first question is from Jeff and his question is, how do you approach writing and speaking for a character that is smarter than you intellectually? which I know isn't a problem for you because you're very, very smart, but clearly for Jeff, it's a stretch. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I'm actually, one of the things I'm writing now, uh, one of the characters is absolute genius. And uh, I try to approach it not intellectually, but emotionally. Uh, why is he so driven to, to do this? Um, it's not unlike writing for someone who's physically braver than I am. You know, I, I don't have to match them in their attributes. I just have to try to understand where it comes from, where the drive comes from, what they're trying to accomplish, what's in their way. And then you just rely on the fact that, well, they have capabilities that will carry them uh, uh, further. But it's a, it's a very good question because the temptation is to try to write brilliant, right? try to write genius, and you can't do that. What you can do is write character. I'm sure Jeff very much appreciates that answer. And Hawk, it appears he understands that gonna... it. What? What, Jen? I said it, it appears that you're going to augment that answer with a physical representation of some. Uh, we were talking earlier about a picture of him with Roy Campanella, and my friends for a birthday gave me the top. Jewish baseball players. You got Sandy Koufax. Sandy Koufax. Uh, Sean Green. Uh, Moisha Ipschwitz. And, oh, no. Uh, no, the battery. Uh, uh, Drysdale. Not Drysdale. Um, Norm oh. Sherry and Larry Sherry. Oh, right, right. And then, and then there's, there's Little Hawk. <laughs> Excellent. So just because because of that, I thought we had to have it. But Jen, go with your questions. Okay, so two very difficult questions that we ask all of the guests that join us here on MPTF Studios. Um, the live show that's happening right now that you're on was a result of the pandemic. It's one of the great things that happened during the pandemic. And all of the residents here have the opportunity to create and stay creative even when they had to be kind of uh, secured into their rooms for their own physical health. So the question from the Motion Picture and Television Fund is, what is your favorite motion picture and what is your favorite television series? Well, I'm going to give you two motion pictures. One, I mean, I've already said Citizen Kane just because it, it I think it changed my life. But also just in terms of, it's not a guilty pleasure, but but just for sheer pleasure, um, there's a Claude Lelouch film from the 70s called And Now My Love. In French, it was called Tout une Vie. I love that film so much. It's a two and a half hour film about how a couple meets. They meet in the last scene in the movie. And he goes back three generations to show how that moment happens. Oh. I just, it's just the pure love of cinema that, that made that film. And I, and I love it. Uh, TV. There's a lot to choose from. I saw an episode this year of The Bear. It's the episode called The Fork. It may be the best half hour I've ever seen on television. 
uh, the acting is just so impeccable. The writing is perfect. And it's a turn in the story from a character that at the beginning you thought was irredeemable. And at this, this, this uh, episode, you go, oh my God, the series is about how he's saved. And the acting is just so subtle and so beautiful that I just marvel at that. I, and I could pick, I'm sure a dozen others if you give me time, but that's been on my mind all year since I've seen it. I, I absolutely know the episode that you're talking about. And I was at a restaurant this weekend and something happened and I, it took me back to that episode where I wow. felt like this, this is a group that really cares about the customers that walk through the door and they do their homework. Yeah, that was an amazing episode. Yeah, and they had, a, go ahead. I was going to say they, they had a couple of really spectacular episodes this past season, but that one was breathtaking. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's a moment uh, when uh, uh, th their guest star, I don't want to spoil a surprise if people haven't seen it, but their guest star is peeling a mushroom. All she does, she peels the mushroom and listens. And it's one of the greatest acting lessons I've ever seen. You don't have to act up a storm, just peel the mushroom properly and listen. And you can't take your eyes off her. It's just great. It's, it's I can't brilliant. wait to see it. Oh, it's brilliant. Can't it's wait. really good. You, you and Molly need to dive into that series. That's a great, yeah. Will do. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bop off. I'll see you uh, in a little bit. Thanks, Hawk. We're done, Phil. Thank you. Uh, we didn't get to everything, but uh, great. And we're gonna have we're gonna have a lunch date soon, and or maybe even bring the bring the ladies. So wonderful, that'd be great. I miss you, and I appreciate your asking me to join you in this. Uh, this is really fun. I really enjoyed it. Terrific, and goodbye, everybody. I'll see you in a couple of weeks with Sam Wasson. We're going to be talking about the new book, uh, Path to Paradise, about. Uh, um, Francis Coppola and Zoetrope. Uh, I think wow. it'll be a really interesting, uh, interesting interview. Go ahead. Can I make a book recommendation? Ed Zwick has just published uh, his memoir. It's a great, great, great book. You've already read it. Wow. Good for yes. you. Well. I have it here. Yeah. And I'm, ho I'm hoping Ed's going to come on the show very oh. soon. He's very busy with much bigger, bigger things. So it's a great, yeah, we look forward to it. Ed is a friend at MPTF, so yes. please invite him on. And Bob Beecher just logged on as well. So I don't know if you've got one more second for Bob to say hello. Of course. Darcy. How you Bob, how are you? Good. How are you doing? Very good. Long time. How you been? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've been well. I've been well. Good. Fighting the good well. fight. Yeah, thank you for doing this. I'm sorry I missed it. I'm going to have to see it in repeats. Yeah. Oh, well, you know what? Hawk and I will just do it over now. Yeah, yeah. You'll, you'll get a residual for the repeat, though, Phil. So, <laughs> okay. So, okay. Part of the new uh, guild. It's part of the new guild deal. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. All right, everybody. All right. Take care.